gardening isn't just for grown-ups. Kids are learning to grow their own food at a Northland school district where gardening is part of the curriculum for all grade levels. That's next. We're like producing a serious amount of food. We hope to be able to provide food for the community. I love sharing a garden with others. You can do a lot of fun things with broccoli. All of our students here are involved in gardening. It has a sign on the door that says my happy place and it really is. Hello and welcome back to Great Gardening. I'm Pamela Fish coming to you from home as we stay safe in place. And our experts are home during the COVID-19 outbreak. They are educator and horticulturist Bob Olin and garden professional Deb Burns Erickson. Thanks for being here. It's our pleasure. Um, Deb, I want to start just by asking you, I know that uh, you've opened your business, which is near your home, and it, the Burns Greenhouse, but uh, you, like other nurseries and other businesses, have some guidelines to follow. Can you just outline that a little bit for us? Right, so we are adhering to all of the guidelines with the um, still the social distancing, um, making more room, more one ways, um, and, and mostly we're trying to uh, make sure that everyone respects each other's space and um, that's real important to us and for our checkouts and for um, just adapting to everyone's needs, having um, you know special times in the morning for the elderly and the immune compromised and just to be, um, again, as respectful as we can to everyone and to really take this seriously. Right. Uh, I know Bending Birches is doing something similar um, as our other local greenhouses. A lot of them opening up this weekend and we hope that folks patronize those businesses. You can check online and, and see how they're handling customers during the COVID-19. Well, no phone volunteers with us to take your calls, but please email your questions and we'll do our best to get it on our program. Email at ask at wdse.org. All right, um, Bob, you're, you shared some photos of us for our signs of the season. What are you seeing out there? Well, things are beginning to break. That nice sunny weekend we had uh, kind of opened some things up and I, I've got a shot of some pussy willows there and I think that uh, you can see that this is actually the flower, the same thing with the, our maple trees, the buds as they're unfolding. So I know you're oriented toward uh, children and this is a great opportunity to show them some of the signs of the season. Daffodils are beginning to emerge, um, rhubarb of course, so all of our perennials are coming out of the ground, uh, a lot of them are at least. And also Bob, a lot of people are um, looking to plant apple trees right now and you uh, are sharing something with us for with some information about that. Yeah, people will be selecting trees and it's always my feeling that you should start with the hardiest, even if you're zone four, uh, let's get some real hardy varieties. We go way back to the Harrelson uh, varieties and Harold Red, which is a sport of Harrelson. People said that was gonna go away with the new varieties and it was introduced uh, almost 100 years ago now, and it's still one of the uh, the hardiest. So start with the real hardy ones, Sweet 16, State Fair, uh, Zest, uh, um, certainly uh, Harrelson and, and Harold Red. Start with the hardiest, and then you can branch out into some of those that uh, are a little bit less hardy. Okay, great. Well, a few years back, a school on the South Shore of Lake Superior took up gardening. Their efforts resulted in district-wide gardening programs and some national acclaim. I'm Greta Kochevar, and I'm the Green and Healthy Coordinator for the Washburn School District. And this is our elementary school vegetable garden and orchard. We have raised beds, and we can have a whole class come out, um, circle up around the raised beds, and then every child can do their planting. It's actually integrated into the curriculum for all 4K through 6th grade here at this building. So a lot of this food, the kids at the elementary level, they harvest it with their teachers. They taste it and they do snacks and they cook with it. Pumpkins, potatoes, cucumbers, we do a late planting, so we get a late harvest. I mean, it's just so fun for kids to be able to pull carrots. If there's any extra surplus of potatoes or 
squash, then the cafeteria gets that food. So they know their friends or their classmates or grew it. They know it's really fresh. I'm Al Krause, I'm the elementary school principal here at Washburn School District. Just over three years ago, um, in April of 2016, we received a call from the White House that they had heard about our garden program and wanted to recognize it. It was an incredible honor, obviously, for our community to be selected, because this really was a community project when it started. All of our students here are involved in gardening. Um, we have green and healthy standards right on our report card, so it's a, it's a way of life around here. More from Washburn schools coming up as we tour gardens from their elementary and high school programs. They're learning business skills too through gardening, so it's it's great what they're um, what they're taking in out there. Uh, we're going to go to questions now, you guys, and uh, we did get quite a few between last show and this one. Um, Here's one about um, a delphinium that suffered from powdery mildew the last several years. Uh, she thinks though that it's planted too close to the baptisia and that might be hampering airflow around the delphinium. So can it be transplanted or should she start a new plant at a different location? Well, I think she's right on there in terms of the uh, air circulation. Uh, delphinium, of course, should be staked up and you want to give them plenty of room. Uh, you know, the powdery mildew, we're seeing more and more of that with our warmer summers. And I think that uh, people have to be more, more conscious of that. On some of the vine crops, we're seeing quite a bit of a hybridization that's eliminating some of those problems, but on, on flowers like delphinium, separate them out. She could move it right now if she wanted to. Okay, all right. Deb, did you have uh, thoughts about that? Yeah, I think if she did move it, then, um, and, and got it yeah, as far away as she can, but also clean up the soil a bit when she is um, digging it up, just if there are some spores near it. You don't want to contaminate where you're moving it to also. And uh, yeah, give it plenty of room, like Bob said. And there's always the option to buy, buy another one, right? <laughs> you know, the good thing about party mildew, it looks ugly, but it doesn't kill the plant. It's... Uh, you know, it's, it's one of the more benign fungi and uh, it shouldn't impact uh, the overall quality of it. But to eliminate it, she really needs to give it some better airflow and make sure it gets staked. Okay. Um, so we've had a couple questions, you guys, uh, about lawn damage. And I know we saw one last week too. Voles uh, were damaging the lawns and shrubs. Uh, Mary in Kettle River is looking for something that might be done to prevent this from happening next year. Deb, thoughts on that? Uh, preventatives are tough. Um, I mean, like the lawn damage that was done, that, you know, will go away. It's not like she has to um, correct that. And this was just a really bad year for, with that warm ground and heavy snowfall. Um, this was a lot worse than I've ever seen, but preventative, I'm not sure. Bob would probably know more on that. Well, I would say that all smooth bark trees and shrubs need some kind of a protective collar around them because the voles or field mice will be right under that snow line until they find something that they can get their little teeth into and they do quite a bit of damage. So protect, protect all woody materials and I think we see it a little bit every year but you're right Deb uh, this year was particularly bad because of the uh, very early snow cover that we had. The other thing you can do is you can try to open areas up they don't like to be exposed so if you've got a perimeter around the garden and people may think I'm a little nutty but even taking that snow blower out and just uh, opening up a perimeter around your small beds or your garden space uh, then there's an exposed area that they don't like to be uh, available. So you got a little perimeter. So there's a non-chemical way. But physical barriers and trying to open things up a little bit are going to be your best choice. Okay. Um, here's a question about star magnolia, which um, I know would be budding out now. And Sharon is wondering about trimming it and uh, how much should be trimmed. Deb? Right, how much does she want to trim right now? If the buds are there, she's not going to want to trim it now. 
She's gonna want those buds to break into flower before she cleans it. You know, at least get them through their blooming cycle before she starts to, you know, if it is just for, uh, for the look of it or if it's crossing and it's getting tight, but I would let it go until it's done blooming so you don't cut up, lose any of your buds. And Bob, is there- yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Bob, is there a recommended amount to cut something like a magnolia? Well, any time of pruning, I think she has to ask herself why. Maybe she feels it's overgrown a little bit, but now when she prunes, if she wants to prune during the summer, she must understand that you're taking away some of the vegetative material and this is impacting the overall vigor of the plant. So she might be better off uh, just taking a little look and pruning very late winter or after the leaves have fallen in the fall and take one or two limbs off when it's in a dormant state. Okay. Um, here's one that I hadn't heard of, but I know Deb, you said you've seen this. Is anyone growing pawpaw in Duluth? That's from James. I don't there, even know what it is. There's been some um, hybridization and, you know, um, um, getting it a little bit more hardy, but it's still, you know, a four. And I, th I think also getting a rootstock, a really good rootstock on it to support that plant is really important. Um, but again, it's real borderline and they're really pushing it on the zone four and they're really doing the trial themselves because it, it hasn't been proven as much to, for our area. And so if they get it, that's great, you know, take good care of it and, you know, nurture it as much as you can. And Bob, it's, uh, is this an edible? Oh yeah, it's edible. It's actually become one of those fashionable fruits. It's a little unusual. I, I think it's, uh, it's kind of a cross between some of the uh, tropical fruits, but it is native, but it's native to much warmer parts of the United States. And as Deb said, they're probably trying to hybridize. I always advise people rather than stretching out for some of the exotics, let's figure out how to grow uh, those fruits that we know are hardy for this area. That's, there are enough challenges there to begin with. Now back to the Washburn School Gardens, where every class from preschool to high school learns lessons from the earth. In 2006, we did a revamp of our wellness policy, and that group decided to start a, um, a school garden. And so it started really small, started about um, the size of this grassy area. And over the years, we just kind of kept expanding bigger and bigger. And right now it's a nice size for us because um, every child has about a square foot. So there's enough space for everybody, all the kids in this elementary school. Students are um, really excited to come outside right at the beginning of the school year especially. Every grade gets to come out with their teacher um, through their crops, you know, through the crop theme that that grade is in charge of. They get to make kale smoothies. We grow kale and broccoli and other brassicas with them. Each grade has something. Sixth grade's herbs for making their own tea and then they learn about, you know, added sweeteners and pop, you know, trying to switch to tea from pop. I mean, it's limitless. Just grow the crops that we know we can plant at the end of May and harvest in mid to late September. And it gives us a ton of food to work with in the middle school. They know their friends or their classmates or grew it. They know it's really fresh. This is our row of raspberries, which are a late variety on purpose so that they won't be quite ready as early as others and they last basically till frost. So every grade shares these perennial crops up here because everyone wants a chance to have the delicious raspberries. I hope it just feels natural for them to come outside and enjoy the harvest in the fall and then planting in the spring and just to tune into the seasons and be aware of the amazing place we live in. <laughs> We had um, asphalt covering this whole area and we decided to expand the science department and build this aquaponics lab. Uh, the science department and the family and consumer science department partnered together to make a class called Food Science and the Environment. We have a high tunnel here where those same Food Science Environment students take care of the winter high tunnel and they grow lettuce and carrots and other cool season crops in the late fall. And then late spring in May, we get our summer crops put in and we actually have um, a team of high school students who get credit over the summer to manage the high tunnel like a, like a farm. We call them agripreneurs. Here we're growing 
um, tomatoes and basil, which is all being sold to Deleuze, which is a, the local pizza place. The Ecology Club de decided we were going to add two of the, all the gardens here and try to do a demonstration garden for the, the community to show all the ver various native species we have and how important they are for all our pollinators and butterflies. And Each section is a different native grass and that the students germinated all the grasses and, and grew them up at the local um, nursery, the uh, Wildflower Woods Nursery. They really, really come to appreciate the beauty of each of the species. We get a lot of kids involved. I mean, there's, in the spring they're cleaning it up and they help plant and they help collect seeds and grow plants and it's a win-win for the environment and for the students and the community. Obviously the situation a little different at the schools right now, but I know they've had a lot of volunteers throughout the summer who have helped keep their gardens and, and hopefully they're going to be able to continue to do that throughout this growing season as well. Um, so we said we were going to get back to a question about blueberries, if I can find it. Oh, okay. So Bob, what is the uh, springtime care for blueberry bushes? Julie has pulled a lot of the winter mulch away from the plants, but is kind of wondering about what to do next. Very good question. First, you want to survey them, and it probably depends a little bit on how, how old the plants are. These are plants that uh, in about the fifth year, they really start to become very productive, and then they'll be productive for the next uh, 20 or 30 years if you manage them properly. Take a quick look. We do have a lot of what we call witch's broom because we have a lot of balsam. This is caused by a fungi. If you see some real irregular growth, you wanna make sure you cut that out immediately and go down the stem because it gets to be systemic. So any witch's broom needs to come out. If it's an older planting, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years, she might wanna remove one of the stems that's, that's the oldest and least productive right at the base. And then this is the time of year when you wanna have some fertility and uh, Again, I'd be looking at just an application of ammonium sulfate. For some reason, I see a lot of recommendations from, for aluminum sulfate. Stay away from those. Spin the package around. If the aluminum sulfate is the acidifying agent, look for ammonium sulfate. That'll give you the nitrogen you need, and it also will help to maintain the lower acidity or the higher acidity, lower pH that's really desirable for blueberries. A little fertilizer, a little pruning, they don't require a lot of maintenance, but this is the time of year to be doing that. And nothing indicated that we're going to have trouble with our blueberries at this point? That snowfall was great. I'm really looking forward to just a spectacular blueberry crop. And they, again, are one of our very best native fruits. We've got some good hybrids uh, that are in the market. Many of them developed by the University of Minnesota. Very appropriate. And I would be focusing on getting some really good yields. And this should be a very good year. And as we've been hearing for years, they're really good for you, too. They are loaded with nutrition. They happen to taste good, too. Win-win. Okay. Um, Deb, this question falls right in line with our um, theme this week. Gina from Eveleth has a three- and a five-year-old who'd really like to, uh, she'd really like to introduce to gardening vegetables, um, planting a raised bed, so is wondering what you'd recommend for some easy care vegetables that kids could help grow and would like. Right, and, and whether they want to start some seeds ahead of time, um, maybe, you know, some easy tomatoes uh, and even marigolds for the outside, just something that they're going to have success with. And then a lot of times if people focus on some of the smaller fruit or vegetables, um, like a smaller cherry tomato, um, uh, radishes, carrots, things that they're going to have success with and there's going to be a lot of them. A lot of times if you plant a large tomato, you know, like a slicer, it takes a long time. They don't get a reward right away. And the smaller ones, they'll start to fruit a lot quicker. So you gotta reward the kids and give them, you know, some motivation to continue. And um, just start them with some easy things like, again, small tomatoes, um, carrots, um, um, or you could also get some transplants and help them to plant them out too so that they have success going throughout the season. Okay. Um, 
Here's one that I, I guess I hadn't thought about, but um, does spraying for deer with any of the usually available sprays have any effect on pollinators? That's from Diane and Duluth. And Bob, I know that, um, you know, a lot of these things have mostly organic materials in them, right? That's right. I, I wouldn't be concerned about them. Most of them are either uh, uh, egg derivatives of one type or another, or they come from some of the slaughterhouses and uh, they're organic. And uh, I don't think that there's a problem at all with the honeybees or other uh, native bees. Great. Well, that's, that's good news. Um, Linda has put in a new raised garden and uh, surrounded it by landscape blocks, but wants to plant a tree in the area. However, is concerned about the roots being shallow and pushing on the bricks. What, what do you think about that? Well, my thought would be that I don't think she really wants to plant it in the raised bed. And then if she's adjacent to the raised bed, those roots are going down. So that shouldn't be a problem to the, the block she's used to, to create the raised bed. So keep it a little ways away. Uh, she wants to be aware they grow fast. You don't want to shade your raised bed. So shading would be a bigger issue if it's being planted outside of the bed. And I really wouldn't recommend planting it within the bed. Shade and other issues that are going on there. Thoughts, Deb? Yeah. Or she wants to use that raised bed for vegetables. Absolutely, she doesn't, you know, use it for something that you'd, you'd get a lot of value out of it and move the tree away from it so it doesn't shade. That's exactly what I thought too. You know, the other thing, she mentioned uh, masonry blocks there for constructing the raised bed. You have to be aware there can be some leaching and we can run into a, an alkalinity issue. So she just wants to make sure uh, that she doesn't have a high pH, which can be detrimental. And she may want to, adjust some of her fertility regimen to keep that pH down if in fact uh, some of the uh, carbonate components from the cement tend to bleed into the, uh, the soil. We love seeing and sharing a look at what gardeners are growing all across our region. Here's this week's Grow and Show. Shirley Long Gardens in Marengo, Wisconsin, where lots of lovely lilies grow and obviously thrive on the care she gives them Shirley is a master gardener with the Ashland Bayfield County Group. She grew other lovelies as well and caught sight of pollinators on the coneflower and bright yellow sunflower. Another favorite, this yellow dahlia. And Lena Constantini of Ironwood, Michigan is done with snow, awaiting the return of her many multicolored flower beds where red blossoms mix, the bee balm and phlox pair up. Hydrangea are hardy yet delicate looking in any of her gardens. And Lena too has a bevy of bees that seek out the pollen of flowers and plants. If you have garden delights to share, send them to greatgardening at wdse.org so we can show what you grow. Okay. Um great flowers. We love seeing them. Deb has some to show us too, but Deb, I want to ask you a question first. Um, Linda, who lives north and west of Duluth, likes to hang baskets in a place, an old windmill, that has a lot of sun and wind, but is wondering what flowers can handle those conditions without drying out so quickly. Well, a great one is the Calibrachoa, Calibrachia, Million Bells, um, Super Bells. They're great, they have a small foliage, they have a small flower, so they can really take the wind going through them and they can dry out a little bit. Um, you gotta watch them that they don't get root bound, but um, they're really good for those conditions. Another thing that's really good is petunias, and we have some new petunias this year, some novelty petunias that are a black and white. Um, this is a gold one, a midnight gold double. And then we also have a single one that is a headliner. It's just novel and just, you know, attention getting. Those are always kind of fun to play with too. Okay, um, Bob, we have a question that comes with pictures as we sometimes do. And this is of a cherry tree and Evans Bali cherry that has a, attracted some kind of a fungus or contracted something. Yeah, in this particular situation, they did send uh, several photos, which I'm very appreciative of. Because when I got to the second, I saw that severe damage. And I said, that really looks like that's 
uh, some kind of a sun skull that's broken apart that outer layer. And then when they showed us the site, it's very, very exposed. So even though this is a hardy cherry for the area, the rootstock's hardy and the plant's hardy, open and exposed like that, you have to protect the bark. So I think what happened here is we really had either some sun skull damage or some winter damage, and that opened up the bark. And then what a lot of the fungi she sees, they're really secondary feeders that are feeding on the damaged material. So that's not really causing the injury. Looks to me like it's winter injury, and we really have to be very conscious, particularly the farther north we get on the Minnesota side up toward the range in International Falls, protect from those northwest winds. They can be very, very damaging, as well as the sun scald in March. That is all for this week. Uh, please follow us on Instagram. Go to our website for updates and past episodes. You'll also uh, find our show on YouTube. Bob, Deb, again, thank you a ton for your great advice and counsel for gardeners. Uh, we really appreciate it. From all of us here at Great Gardening, thanks for watching, and especially now, enjoy the garden. Funding for Great Gardening is brought to you by the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota.